Well, he was nine months old, but he was already walking. It didn't seem possible that a human being could be upright and mobile at this age. Our oldest son. And because he was now mobile, I knew that there was a world of danger available to him. So I toddled him over to the electric wall outlet and gave him the lecture on the danger of electricity while he looked in the other direction and picked his nose. (laughs) I thought it was a, a bit of an act of futility. I said, don't ever touch this, don't ever stick anything into it, as he did this. Well, the next day I was reading the newspaper before the days of the glorious iPad. And I heard the toddle of little feet come down the hallway. And looking out of the corner of the newspaper, I saw him peek his little head around the corner. Thought that I didn't see him, and he made a beeline for that outlet. I have parents already shaking their heads. But this is the thing that's interesting. Just before he reached out to touch it, he did this. Now he's nine months old, he knows exactly what he's doing. That that last glance back is a sad, fateful reminder of something dark inside this little boy. There already. He knows this is wrong, but the fact that it's wrong somehow attracts him to it. He knows his daddy has said, don't do this, but there's something about that that makes him want to do this. This is who he is. Well, I'm here this morning to give you bad news, real bad news. Bad news I wish I could avoid bad news. Bad news I wish this wasn't true, bad news. Bad news I wish this didn't include me, bad news. Now maybe you're sitting thinking, thinking, Paul, you don't know what's going on in my life. I got enough bad news. I don't need to come on Sunday morning and sit in a pew and have somebody from Philadelphia give me more bad news. Well, here's the the problem. It's only when you humbly open your heart to the devastating, dark, bad news of the gospel that you'll ever open your heart to the glorious, wonderful, great, beautiful, good news of the gospel. To the degree that you minimize the bad news, to that degree you will devalue the good news. And I think that that struggle uh, operates in our hearts all the time. I think we have, we have a great ability to, to do anything we can to minimize this dark news because we don't want to think about it, we don't want to face it, we don't want to believe it's us. And you don't realize that when you do that, then you lessen your sense of need for and your sense of celebration for the good news that the Bible has to offer because somehow you're saying to yourself, I don't actually need this because things are not that bad for me. Oh my, what a problem that is. I don't want to believe that, that anything the Bible says that's dark and bad has anything to do with me. I'm Paul Tripp, I'm okay. And there are ways in which I participate in that delusion in my own life all the time. And I'm about to hurt your feelings, so do you. And so I want to take you to one of the darkest, weirdest passages in all the Bible. This is the kind of passage, if you're preaching through, the, through a book, you think as a pastor, oh my goodness, I gotta preach this one. Uh, I don't know if it just says something about my level of sanity 
that I have one opportunity to preach on Sunday at Coral Ridge and I decide to preach from this passage. But I think this passage has important things to confront us with and con- in confronting us with those things has glorious comfort for us. Mark 5. If you have a Bible or an iPad or an iPhone, or I always have to say this, some weird, sad, off-brand, follow as I read. And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles to pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to, to depart from their region. Interesting. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but he said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Now, you have to ask yourself the question, why is this dark, weird story in the Bible? And, and why, why all the graphic details of this story? There, there are all kinds of theological issues and theological questions in this passage. And I want to warn you, I'm not going to answer those for you. Because what I want to do is I want to, I want to take the helicopter view of this passage and and alert you to the fact that the Bible is marked with these dark stories because you and I need them. Because this is one of those moments, if you could could imagine that evil unrestrained would take over you, that if evil was able to do its work, if this thing that we're so able to minimize and say, this is really not my problem, if it could have its reign over you, this is where it would go. This is how bad it would get. This is how dark it would become. And so this passage is meant to function not just to demonstrate to us the glorious rescuing power of the Redeemer, but to alert us to the dark danger of something that we're so easily able to minimize. Because to the degree that you're able to minimize evil, to that degree you will definitely devalue the glorious grace that is your only hope. And that's our struggle. 
Now let me just work through this. The first thing this passage confronts you with is you live in a world where real personal evil exists. You cannot live as an evil amnesiac. You do not live in a righteous world. The world that we live in is not operating the way God intended. It's dramatically broken. Romans 8 says the whole world groans waiting for redemption. And and if you you don't take that seriously, if you don't take the dark brokenness of your world, you live with unrealistic expectations and naivety toward temptation. This world's a broken place. There's there's never a day in your life where you you aren't touched by its brokenness. We aren't greeted with its darkness where you don't have to face its temptation. It's there everywhere around you, and it doesn't take much for us to get sucked in. I mean, come on. A flat tire can bring some of us 50% of the way to atheism. (laughs) Doesn't take a whole lot for us. And so you must, you must wake up alert. Parents, you must realize the world that you're raising your children up into. You're not raising your children in a righteous world. Husbands and wives, your marriage exists in a world where there's temptation all around you. You must realize that. You do business in a world where dark things happen. You must realize that. You read this story and you wish this story wasn't the Bible. You wish none of this stuff ever existed. You wish the world wasn't this way. You wish you could rip these pages out and deny their existence. But one thing that biblical faith will never ask you to do, biblical faith will never ask you to deny reality. You never have to deny reality. We can look reality in the face. We can look darkness in the face because of the power of what Jesus has done. If you have to deny reality in order to reach peace, you may have temporary peace, but you're not exercising biblical faith. There's a second thing that you're confronted with in this passage, and this will sound silly to you when I say it, but, but it is a problem for us. Evil is ugly. It's ugly. If you're taking notes, write it down. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror in the morning. It's ugly. It will not take you anywhere good. There's not much beauty in this passage. And the problem for me is I don't always see evil as ugly. In fact, there are moments in my life where evil looks absolutely beautiful to me. What God says is wrong is actually attractive to me. I mean, If you're on the Fort Lauderdale Beach, how's that for a local example? How am I doing? I'm a Philly boy. Uh, And and you're lusting after a woman on the beach, you don't see ugly, do you? You don't see danger. You see beauty. At that moment, what God says is ugly isn't ugly to you. It's actually beautiful to you. That's a big problem. When you're sharing a scintillating uh, secret gossip with somebody that has the potential to destroy somebody's life, you're not feeling ugly, are you? You're feeling the buzz of passing that detail. You get to be the one who gives it to somebody else. Yeah. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Doesn't feel ugly that moment. When you've just cheated on your taxes, you don't see ugly. You're already shopping in your mind, right? You're already at the grand mental mall in your brain, already 
thinking about how you're gonna spend all the stuff that you have required, gotten in your ill-gotten gain. When you're up in somebody's face and you're screaming at them, you don't see ugly, you feel the power of anger, the power of watching somebody do this and back off. And you walk down the hallway, you feel powerful and you say, man, I told them. I'm the man. They won't, they won't cross me again. Doesn't feel ugly. Listen, you don't just need grace to deliver you from evil. You need grace to see evil for evil. Pray for it. Because my problem is I can look at what is wrong and it looks beautiful to me. God help me, God deliver me, I need help. Because these eyes don't work the way they should. This heart doesn't work the way it should. It's a problem. It's the third thing you're confronted with in this passage. Is that this This man, although living in a fallen, broken world of evil, his biggest problem was inside of him, not outside of him. Now you say, well, Paul, wait a minute. This man man was possessed by an evil spirit. He's 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 in a unique category. Yes, he is. But the Bible would teach us in a thousand passages that all of us have been overtaken by evil. All of us have this stuff inside of us. Let me read from you, for you, from Genesis 6. This is God's assessment just before the flood. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, I hate this verse. This is such a hard verse to accept. Listen to this. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now listen to the the craft of the words. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. How could it be more comprehensive? How could it be any worse than this? You couldn't string words together that were darker than these words. That's what sin does to us. And here's the problem. I I am very good about being concerned about the sin of others. I'm very good at recognizing the evil that exists in others, but I'm very skilled at minimizing my own. And here the gospel, yes, if you're a believer, the power of sin has been broken, but the presence of sin still remains and is being progressively eradicated by God's grace. That means this dark thing is still there inside of you in ways. And I'm, I'm, I'm so skilled at telling myself I'm not the problem. My problem is my environment. My problem is my relationships. My problem is my schedule. My problem is anything but me. And you see, the minute you are able to convince yourself that your biggest problem is outside of you, not inside of you, again, you quit becoming excited about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if you ask a child, who has just pushed another child and they've fallen against the wall and bumped their head, what, why they did that, what do you expect they're gonna say? Well, I've got evil inside of my little heart and you should expect worse. <laughs> I've never had my children say that. They never talk about themselves. They talk about everything else but themselves. And, and it's not just 
that the wrong that they did scares me. Hear what I'm saying. That self-righteous diagnosis scares me more. Because there I'm standing, that child doesn't want my help. He doesn't want to be parented. He doesn't want to be guided. He doesn't want wisdom. He doesn't want grace because he announces to himself, even as a young child, it's not me. And I'm now a parent of a child. I have the most glorious answer that I could ever give to a human being, and my little one doesn't want it. Doesn't want it. It's the most beautiful message you could ever hear. It's the grand, great solution of the grand, great problem, and this little one already has convinced himself, I have no need of that because I'm righteous. Leave me alone. My daughter brings her report card home years ago, and she says, Dad, I need to talk to you about my report card. You know right away that's bad news, (laughs) right? If it needs a preamble, it's not going to be good news. So I said, okay. She said, it's my grade in English. That happens to be the language she speaks. (laughs) I said, okay. She said, I got a D in English, but I know why. It's this teacher. (laughs) You know, Dad, he's learning to teach on us. And I talk to even the smart kids, and they barely got B's and C's. I mean, she's feeling quite confident in this conversation with me. She is just basking in the throes of her self-righteousness and wants me to buy in. She's not thinking of notes poorly taken, tests poorly studied for, goofing off in class, and none of that has anything to do with it. She is absolutely convinced this grade on this report card that has my name on it about the language I speak has no messages about me whatsoever. (laughs) That's like you saying to someone, I'm not angry. I'm not angry. Do you read my lips? I'm not angry at you. I'm just making a point. Because you don't want to believe that this thing is inside of you. Let me give you the dynamic here. If you're God's child and you do what was wrong, what is wrong, your conscience will bother you, right? That's the, that's the beautiful convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit. When your conscience bothers you, you only have one of two choices. Here they are. You confess that that wrong is wrong, humbly, and you place yourself once again under the justifying mercies of Christ, or watch this, you'll wreck some sense of self-justification that will make that wrong acceptable to your conscience. We're very good at doing that. And so the man who's lusting will say, that wasn't lust, I'm just a man who enjoys beauty. (laughs) This kind of beauty. I'm celebrating the Creator. It was actually worship. (laughs) You're on a roll. A person who's been gossiping on the phone, it's a terrible thing. You're destroying a reputation on another person. Said That wasn't gossip. It was just a very extended, personal, detailed prayer request. We should pray. Let's pray right now. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, a person who's on an ugly quest for power will say, I don't love power. I'm just exercising God-given leadership gifts. I've got to be a good steward of my gifts. A parent has just screamed at their child in unbridled parental anger because you're actually angry that this child needs to be parented. We'll say, I wasn't, I wasn't angry. I was just being like one of God's prophets. Thus says the Lord. I'm in the train of those who speak the truth. I don't want to believe that the greatest danger in my life is inside me, not outside of me. And I I want to invite you right now in this moment to open your hearts 
let down your defenses and face yourself. I mean it. I thought a lot about this as I was preparing to speak, and I am compelled to tell you my own story. Some of you have heard this. I was a very, very angry man. I didn't know I was an angry man. I explained away that anger moment after moment, day after day. I was a pastor. I was in the midst of destroying my life and my ministry. And I didn't get it because I was so skilled at saying it wasn't me. Luella, my dear wife, in ways that showed amazing grace, would bring that anger to me. And I would always wrap my robes of righteousness around me and tell her what a great husband she had. I would tell her that I thought her problem was discontent. I was convinced of that. She was just a discontent woman. And I told her I'd pray for her. That helped her. That's a lie. There was one moment, I've talked about this many times, there was one moment where she was confronting me and I'm, I was listing all the great things that I do as a husband, detailing the extensive catalog of my righteousness. And I got on a roll and I said this, these deeply humble words, 95% of the women in our church would love to be married to a man like me. How's that for humility? Luella very quickly informed me she was in the 5%. <laughs> you see, there it was. I was preaching. I was sharing God's grace. I was concerned about the condition of the world, but I was very skilled at denying how deep my need was. Hear this. Between the already and the not yet, every human being is a very skilled self-swindler. Own it. No one swindles you more than you do. Because no one talks to you more than you do. It's inside of me. It's inside of me, and I need help. There's a fourth thing here that, that you, you, you are confronted in this passage with the utter self-destructive nature of evil played out in this moment where you, where it's like a, a huge metaphor where at night this man is beating himself with rocks and cutting himself. And you see, if evil were able to have free reign in me, what it would cause in me. Listen, what God says is wrong will never take you anywhere good. Stepping over God's boundaries is always self-destructive. And here's what happens. Temptation is always selling the constructive possibility of evil. That's what temptation does. Temptation sells to you the constructive possibility of evil, that somehow it will build something good into your life. Isn't that true of Adam and Eve? That's exactly what the serpent is saying. You think you have the good life? If you do this thing, it will build even more good into your life. That's what temptation is about. Temptation always sells the constructive power of what God says is destructive. So that woman at work is presented to me as a better mate than my wife, and she will offer things that will bring a better life to me. That's the constructive power of adultery being sold to me. It's adultery is never constructive. It's always destructive. 
And so that child who has disobeyed his parents, what's being sold is the constructive power of autonomy, independence, no authority over me. If I have no authority over me, that's the good life. Listen, living independently, pushing down all the walls of authority, it's never a good thing. It's destructive, it's never constructive. And you have to be careful that you don't listen to the voices that present to you the constructive possibility of what God says is destructive. I will tell you some way every day what is destructive will be presented to you as being constructive. Maybe it's at the low level of saying, well, it's, it's only once. What difference does it make? Now, sometimes we're able to see it. I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here, but it won't be the first time. Probably won't be the last. There are areas of sin where you, you actually see their destructive quality. If, if you're a consistent glutton, you will carry around the empirical evidence of your gluttony, right? You'll get bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger than you ever thought you could get, bigger than your frame is, is made to carry. That's a, that's a, that's a, a a visual picture of what seems to be constructive is actually destructive. You see it in addiction. You see what happens to the body of an addict. You are seeing that what seems to be constructive, I can, I can do this drug and I, I feel better and I think better and it seems like constructive, you can actually see the destructive quality physically in me. But there's a lot of areas where it's not that clear where you have to believe that what God says is right, that evil never takes you anywhere good, it never takes you anywhere constructive. It's not constructive. It's always destructive. Don't allow yourself to be snookered. Don't allow yourself to be seduced. Temptation always sells to you the constructive power of evil, the constructive power of what God says is destructive. There's another thing. The very clear, very clearly we are confronted in this passage with human inability to restrain or defeat what we're now talking about. The passage actually says that. This man could not be restrained by human effort. And we want to believe that somehow, some way, we have the ability in and of ourselves to harness, handle, or deal with this. We actually talk in terms like this, anger management. Anger management. That has about as much sense as jumbo shrimp. because there's something inside of you that you can't manage. If you harness the behavior some way, so instead of pounding a person, you pound a pillow, you're still pounding the pillow because you haven't been released from the thing that is the problem. It's still there. Sure, it's better that you beat up a pillow, not a person, but you're still an angry person. You haven't managed anger. You've taken it to a different place. Pray for the pillows. I'm going to start a pillow rescue mission for all the abused pillows out there that are a result of anger management classes. 
You see, to the degree that you tell yourself this is manageable, again, to that degree you don't run after grace. You can't manage it. Now we fall into that. You're disappointed with your husband or wife. I talked about this this weekend. And so you threaten them. Because you think if you can raise a big enough threat in that person's life, you can alter their behavior. Who do you think you are? You have no ability to remove the darkness that exists in the heart of your spouse. None, 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 none. Is that good enough? Nada. You don't. Or a parent thinks by raising the volume of your voice, you can change your child. Have you ever had your children say to you, no, when you're talking to me softly, I was a rebel, but the minute you raised your voice, I could feel my heart change. The volume did it, Dad. If you would scream at me all the time, I think I could be righteous. Just yell at me. You're laughing because it's crazy when you think about it. You'll say things, you don't want me to have to come up those steps one more time. It'll be on the news. (laughs) Father disciplines children, pictures and details at 11. No, you're buying into power you don't have. Because you want to think that somehow you can manage you and you can manage others, and if that were possible, this story wouldn't ever exist. Jesus would have never come. It's all a waste. Not only is it dark, not only is it destructive, not only is it inside of me, I have no ability to lick it, none. I'm beyond my wisdom, I'm beyond my strength, I'm beyond my ability. That's why this story doesn't change until the Redeemer's on sight. Because here's the bottom line. Any recognition of the nature of evil, as we've detailed it from this passage, requires the help of a Redeemer. Any honest recognition of the nature of evil leaves you with one conclusion. There must be a redeemer or there is no hope. I'm here because I long for us together to give up on us and to run to the redeemer. I want to say this to you because I deeply think it's true. It's a story of my life. It's the passion of my heart. The doorway to hope is personal hopelessness. The doorway to hope is personal hopelessness. As long as you minimize what's inside of you, as long as you think you can manage it, as long as you say it's external and that internal, as long as you do all that stuff, you haven't reached the hopelessness that will make you reach out for the help and the hope of the Redeemer. Listen, this passage screams one thing. Is there a Redeemer for this man? Will a Redeemer show up? Will a Redeemer come? Will he care? Now, I have to say this. We don't believe in a system of redemption. We don't believe that Christianity is a system of liberating commands, principles, and wisdom, and if you get a hold of that system, you'll be okay. We don't believe that. I think that's happened to Christianity. I think Christianity has been sadly reduced to a system of theology and rules. 
and we're told you believe the right things and you do the right things and you'll be okay. There are books in your Christian bookstore, you could take the word Jesus out of the book wherever it is and the book would still live because it doesn't need a Jesus in the book because of what it's telling you is you believe the right things, you do the right things, and you'll be okay. Listen, theology is never an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And the end is to confront you with your need and present to you the glorious grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's theology. It defines the identity of God and His grace and it redefines you as a needy one. The rules of Scripture can never deliver you. One of their major purposes is to expose you. They live to expose how deep and dark this stuff is inside of you. You look at those rules and you say, yeah, I can keep all those. No, you don't. Several years back, our Pastor Phil Riken preached through the Ten Commandments. And he would start with a narrow definition of the command. And I'd think, well, hmm, not doing too bad. And then he'd start expanding it. And every Sunday it was the same thing. That, that, that series just, just uh, unfolded how deeply needy I am. And then he would take us to Christ. So the law has an important function. It gives you a, a sense of how God wants you to live. But listen, the law will never deliver you. We don't trust a system of theology and rules. We run with nothing but our brokenness to the loving arms of a Redeemer. Amen. Am I excited about this? Right down to my toes because I know who I am. It doesn't take much for me. The person pulls in front of me in the lane that is now mine because I'm in it. <laughs> it's the trip lane, thank you. I've paid my taxes. And they not only pull in front of me, they slow down. Now at that point, I can feel the emotional temperature changing. And I can see that they're texting. I just want them to have an accident. <laughs> and, and at that moment, I'm watching, they're slowing down, they're texting, they're barely holding onto the wheel, they're impeding my sovereign path. And I wanna share something with them, but it wouldn't be Jesus. Listen, at that point, I need more than rules. Listen, I know the rules. I know that's wrong. Listen, if you're, if you're a believer and you're screaming ugly words at somebody, you're not doing that because you're ignorant. You're doing that because that, that, at that point, you don't care about what's right or wrong. You're gonna get what you want. That's what you need to be redeemed from. Those rules won't rescue you. You know the rules. It's like, it's like parking in the no parking spot when you see the sign. Oh, you've done that. And you say these, these things to yourself. I'm only gonna be a second. You're violating the boundaries. You see the sign, you know good and well. This is wrong to do, you shouldn't be doing that. You pull into the handicap spot. You know you don't belong there. You say to yourself, well, three years ago I had a limp. I sprained my ankle. I don't think there's a statute of limitations on that. I guess you could still think that I'm a bit handicapped. People have called me stupid. <laughs> you see, all of this marches to one point. There's one hope. It's the person and the work of a redeemer. Here's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about with all the good preaching, with all the focus on God's grace, I'm concerned that we're still able to tell ourselves we don't actually need a redeemer. 
And hear that. For that you need grace. You don't just need the grace of a Redeemer. You need grace to recognize your need of a Redeemer. Because a dissatisfied wife will say, but you don't know my husband. An impatient husband will say, but you don't know my wife. An angry worker will say, but you don't know my boss. I had a mom say to me, I know the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath, and a harsh word stirs up anger, but whoever wrote that didn't have my children. I would ask you this question. Where in your life are you telling yourself that you need less than a redeemer? Where in your life are you swinging yourself into believing that you can manage what you can't manage, that you can control what you can't control, that you can deliver yourself from what you can't deliver yourself from. I want to say one final thing. It's a beautiful part of the message of grace. It is that the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus, doesn't just deliver. Praise God, he delivers. Praise God, he delivers. Praise God, he delivers. He also restores. What amazed the crowd? Do you remember in reading it, what amazed the people? They marveled because they saw this man with clothes on in his right mind. Listen. Grace has the power to give you back your humanity again. Because see, as a human being, I was meant to live in loving worship of God. I was meant to live in self-sacrificing love of neighbor. And I end up living for myself, and it really is a dehumanizing, sad, broken, destructive way of living, and grace restores. I love the metaphor at the end of Isaiah 55, where it says, when the rain of grace comes down, the thorn bush will become a cypress, and the briar will become a myrtle. Now think about this. If you have a thorn bush in your backyard and it's watered by the rain and the snow, a little thorn bush, what do you expect to get? You don't expect to get a cypress tree, not if you're sane. You expect to get a bigger thorn bush, right? The picture in this, this physical metaphor is a radical personal transformation that by grace, I don't become a bigger, better than me. By grace, I become a different me. Grace can do that. And it's not about becoming more acceptable to God, becoming acceptable to God fully because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But restoration is taking place. This man got back his humanity for one reason. He was delivered by the power of the grace of the Redeemer. Listen, we have to protect this message. We have to protect this story. We cannot let it be diluted, not one bit. We can't let ourselves think there's another way. We can't let ourselves think there's a plan B. We can't be satisfied with good theology and rules. We can't let this message go. Listen, everything the Bible teaches us is we have a problem we can't solve. And on scene has come the grace of a Redeemer who solves it all for us. That message is absolutely non-negotiable. And you're with me t- this morning, but I will tell you what. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're going to be tempted to negotiate that message again. Tell yourself it's not so bad. Tell yourself you can manage what you can't manage. Tell yourself your problem's outside of you, not inside of you. And what you've done is you've backed away from the non-negotiable of this message 
My biggest problem is me, and for that there's a Redeemer. We cannot negotiate this message. We must keep this message pure and must remind ourselves of it every day. The Redeemer has come. He's on sight. And he has the power to crush evil and offer you forgiveness and acceptance and new life. Only the Redeemer can do that.